Welcome to Hello English Teacher. Today let's look at the line by line explanation of the second part of the chapter Silk Road from Class 11 English. If you are watching my video for the first time, please subscribe. You can listen to the explanations of chapters from classes 10, 11 and 12 English. And don't forget to press the bell icon so that you get notified whenever I upload a video. Let's move on to the video now. So we saw that they had reached the town called Hor, which was located on the banks of the river Manasarovar. So the good view of the lake through one of them helped to compensate for the drought. So he was so happy to see the lake because he was extremely excited by looking at the water around whereas the place Hor was totally dry and lacking any kind of vegetation. So he felt happy looking at the water. So he went to drink some tea. I was served by a Chinese youth in military uniform who spread the grease around on my table with a filthy rag before bringing me a glass and a thermos of tea. So a Chinese uh, youth who was wearing a military uniform came there and gave him some tea and he says the place was filthy. With some filthy dirty piece of cloth he had cleaned the table and he had served him a glass of tea. An hour, half an hour later, Satan relieved me from my solitary confinement and when we drove past a lot more rocks and rubbish westwards out of town towards Mount Kailash. So he said that he was in solitary confinement because he was a lonely person sitting inside that cafe. So after some time, Satan, the driver, came and called him. And so they both started again their journey towards the west side which was more filled with rocks and other rubbish and they were going now towards Mount Kailash. My experience in Hor came as a stark contrast to accounts I had read of earlier travellers first encounters with Lake Manasarovar. So he says that whatever experience he had in Hor, it was totally against stark contrast means it was strongly against what he had read about this place. Many travellers had visited this place and they had described the place as very serene and beautiful, calm and all that. But when he came there, it was totally opposite. We saw that it was filled with rubbish and rocks and no water and all that. So, he is saying that his experience was totally opposite to what he had read about this place. Ekai Kawaguchi, a Japanese monk who had arrived there in 1900, was so moved by the sanctity of the lake that he burst into tears. So he remembered one of the Japanese monks named Ekai Kawaguchi who had arrived there, who came to this place in 1900s. So he was so moved by the sanctity, that means the purity and the holiness of this place was so much there that the traveler, that is this Japanese monk, burst into tears. That means he started crying feeling so much happy by looking at the place but now it is totally different. A couple of years later, the hallowed waters had a similar effect on Sven Hedin, a Swede who was not prone to sentimental outbursts. So after some years later also, a Swedish man came there, Sven Hedin. He also was not a sentimental fellow but then when he came there and when he looked at the beauty and serenity and the sanctity of the place, he too started crying. So it was dark by the time we finally left again and after 10.30 pm, we drew up outside a guest house in Darchan for what turned out to be another troubled night. So he was thinking about these travellers who had visited there earlier and how they were prone to outbursts by looking at the beauty and serenity of the place. So they were travelling, they were proceeding further and at 10.30 pm they reached a guest house in Darchan and he says that it turned out to be a troubled night that means he was not able to sleep peacefully there. Kicking around in the open air rubbish dump that passed for the town of Hor had set off my cold once more though it, if truth be told it had never quite disappeared with my herbal tea. So what he says because of the uh, environmental situation in Hor, it was so dirty that his cold had returned and even though he drank the herbal tea, it was not able to relieve him of the cold. One of my nostrils was blocked again and I 
As I lay down to sleep, I wasn't convinced that the other would provide me with sufficient oxygen. So his one nose was blocked. So as he lay down to sleep, he thought that he would be able to breathe properly through the other nostril, but then he was not able to. My watch told me that I was at 4760 meters. It wasn't much higher than Revu and there I had been gasping for oxygen several times every night. So he looked at his watch and he was able to find out the height where he was. He was at 4760 meters. And he says that this place is not higher than Revu where he had started his journey. That was some 5000 feet but here it is only 4000 and I had been gasping for oxygen several times every night. So though he was at 4760 meters, it was difficult for him to get oxygen for breathing. And he says that at Revu, he was finding it very difficult to breathe. I had grown accustomed to these nocturnal disturbances by now, but they still scared me. So he's saying I had grown accustomed to two means I have become used to all these nocturnal disturbances. What is this nocturnal disturbances? Disturbance that could be found in the night, maybe the noise of animals, insects and all those things. So those noises frightened him. Tired and hungry, I started breathing through my mouth. So because his one nostril was closed, he started breathing through his mouth now. After a while, I switched to the single nostril power which seemed to be admitting enough oxygen. But just as I was drifting off, I woke up abruptly. But then after trying to breathe through his mouth, what he did? He tried again, once again to breathe through his one nostril that was open. He said he was getting enough oxygen. And slowly he was going to sleep. But then suddenly he woke up. Something was wrong. My chest felt strangely heavy. I sat up a moment that cleared my nasal passages almost instantly and relieved the feeling in my chest. So something made him get up suddenly. So he got up and sat and he cleared his nose, both the nasal passages and then he felt some relief in his chest. He had a strange feeling. So he sat up and he was able to feel better. Curiously, I thought I lay back down and tried again same result so again when he went to sleep when he tried to lie down the same feeling he had a kind of heavy feeling on his chest but when he sat up it was clear so this feeling was repeating i was on the point of disappearing into the land of nod when something told me not to what is land of nod land of nod means a state of sleeping so he was going to fall asleep but then something told him that he should not sleep and he should be awake. It must have been those emergency electrical impulses again. But this was not the same as on previous occasions. So he is saying that those were the impulses that came from within which made him to be safe, which had helped him to be safe many times. But he is saying that this time the feeling was quite different. This time I wasn't gasping for breath. I was simply not allowed to go to sleep. So he's saying previous times he used to not be able to breathe and this time the thing was he was not supposed to sleep. That means his conscience was telling him not to go to sleep. Sitting up once more immediately made me feel better. So the moment he lay down he felt the heaviness on the chest and when he sat up straight he was feeling better. So I could breathe freely and my chest felt fine. So but as soon as I lay down my sinuses filled and my chest was odd. So the moment he tried to lie down, he was feeling very awkward. That means he was feeling heavy. He was not able to breathe. But the moment he sat up, he was feeling much better. I tried propping myself against the wall, but now I couldn't manage to relax, relax enough to drop off. So he tried to sit up against the wall and try to sleep. But then he was feeling so sleepy and he wanted to relax. But then he was feeling frightened that if he goes off to sleep, something might go wrong. So he wasn't able to sit in a position where he could go to sleep. I couldn't put my finger on the reason. That means I could not point out the reason why I was not able to lie down or sleep. But I was afraid to go to sleep. But he says that he was feeling frightened to sleep. A little voice inside me was saying that if I did, I might never wake up again. So he was getting a warning from within. So telling him that if you sleep, 
you will not get up again. So I stayed awake all night. Satan took me to ja the dark Chen Medical College the following morning. So he's saying that next day the driver, the morning took him to the medical college that was close by. So the medical college at Darchan was new and looked like a monastery from the outside with a solid door that led into a large courtyard. So the description of the medical college is given and it had one single solid door and which led inside you could see a courtyard, a large open space was there. We found the consulting room which was dark and cold and occupied by a Tibetan doctor who wore none of the paraphernalia that I had been expecting. So paraphernalia means whenever you go to a medical college you would see you would expect the doctors to be dressed up in a certain manner. But then when he met the doctor, the Tibetan doctor, he was not dressed up as he expected. So paraphernalia means the miscellaneous items for example the stethoscope or the thermometer or other materials you could see in front of a doctor. No white coat, he looked like any other Tibetan with a thick pullover and a woolly hat. So if it was a doctor, we usually imagine him to be wearing the white coat. But this Tibetan doctor did not have the white coat. He was wearing a thick pullover and a woolen hat. When I explained my sleeplessness, sleepless symptoms and my sudden aversion to lying down, he shot me a few questions while feeling the veins in my wrist. So he explained to the doctor how he did not sleep last night and how he had this aversion means fear to lying down. And then he asked him a few questions and he felt his wrist also. It's a cold, he said finally through Satan. So the doctor told Satan that it was only a cold. A cold and the effects of altitude. So it is a cold that he had and it was the other effects of the altitude means because of the height. It gives you a lot of, you know, you feel suffocated and all that. So combined with cold, it has made him feel so. I'll give you something for it. So I asked him if he thought I'd recover enough to be able to do the Kora. So he asked the doctor if he would be fine and if he would be able to complete his Kora. Oh yes, he said, you'll be fine. So he assured him that he would be able to do what he had come for. I walked out of the medical college clutching a brown envelope stuffed with 15 screws of paper. So he came out, the doctor had given him so many uh, prescriptions. So he came out of the hospital with a brown envelope that had a lot of papers inside. I had a five day course of Tibetan medicine which I started right away. So he had to take medicine for five days, that too, Tibetan medicine. I opened an after breakfast package and found it contained a brown powder that I had to take with hot water. So he had to, the medicine was put in a brown cover and he had to open it and that powder had to be taken with hot water. It tasted just like cinnamon. So cinnamon, you know, the spice. So it was tasting like that. The contents of the lunchtime and bedtime packages were less obviously identifiable. So the powder that he was supposed to take at lunchtime and bedtime were not, he was not able to identify the taste. Uh, both contained small spherical brown pellets. So there were small tiny brown pellets means ball like things. So those were the medicines that he had to take in the afternoon and night. They looked suspiciously like sheep dung. So the pellets, because they were pellets, so he thought that they were looking like the sheep dung, but then they were Tibetan medicine. But of course I took them. That night after my first full day's course, I slept very soundly. So after one day's medicine, he was able to sleep in a very nice manner, like a log, not a dead man. So he was sleeping like a log, means if anybody shake him also, he could not, uh, like he was not able to, uh, he, he would not wake up. So that is sleeping like a log and not a dead man. He was not a dead man. He had a very sound sleep. So once he saw that I was going to live, Satan left me to return to Lhasa. So when the driver understood that he had recovered, the driver allowed him to return to Lhasa. As a Buddhist, he told me he knew that it wasn't real, real matter if I passed away, but he thought it would be bad for business. So he felt that he shouldn't 
nothing bad would happen to him but then if he has passed away that means his business would not pick up so darchin didn't look so terrible after a good night's sleep so it was still dusty partially derelict and punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse but the sun shone brilliantly in a clear sky and the outlook across the plain to the south gave me a vision of the himalayas commanded by a huge snow-capped mountain gurla mandata with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit so chetan was a buddhist and he believed that if his passenger that is if the narrator had died it would affect his business so now he was happy that he had lived and there is no danger of for him so he was happy to leave him to return to lhasa and the next day was very clear and he was able to sleep well and uh, in the morning again he continued his journey and he felt that the place was clear the sky was very clear and he was able to see the snow capped mountains of the himalayas and also he could see this snow capped mountain gurla mandata with a wisp of cloud suspended over it that means a huge cloud was just hanging near its peak the town had a couple of rudimentary general stores selling chinese cigarette soap and other basic provisions as well as the usual strings of prayer flags so he could see that the place had some general stores rudimentary means basic stores very uh, with little facilities and mostly they were selling chinese cigarettes and soaps and other basic provisions and they were also selling the prayer flags so in front of one men gathered in the afternoon for a game of pool the battered table looking supremely incongruous in the open air while nearby women washed their long hair in the icy water of a narrow brook that babbled down past my guest house so the narrator was there in the guest house and from there he could see uh, some men were sitting and playing a game of pool and they had a incongruous table that means the table was not at all fitting to the surrounding it may be very bad or battered and then near them itself there were a group of women who were washing their long hair they babbled means they were just talking rubbish they were just talking uh things that he never understood and so this was a sight that he could see from his guest house darken felt relaxed and hun hurried but for me it came with a significant drawback there were no pilgrims so sorry i was pronouncing darken as darchen it is actually darken so this place darken felt relaxed and unhurried so there was no hurry people were all very calm and quiet and carrying on their works and there was one significant drawback so what was the drawback he could find no pilgrims in that place so he was going to complete his pilgrimage and he could see no pilgrim at all in that place i had been told at the height of the pilgrimage season the town was bustling with visitors so somebody told him that it, when during the pilgrimage season the town would be full of visitors many bought their own accommodation and enlarging the settlement around its edges as they sat up their tents which spilled down on to the plain so people used to build tents and stay there and that used to and cover the entire plain area that was there in that location i timed my arrival for the beginning of the season but it seemed i was too early so he wanted to uh, go in that season but then he felt that he had arrived too early because there were no pilgrims at all one afternoon i sat pondering my options over a glass of tea in darkens only cafe after a little consideration i concluded there were they were severely limited so he started one day as he was drinking tea in the cafe where he was alone so he started thinking what to do why he was alone and all that and then he understood that they were severely limited that means the facilities and other things around in that area were very little so that could also be one of the reasons why the pilgrims were less clearly i hadn't made much progress with my self help program on positive thinking so he was also trying to have some positive thoughts and comfort himself but then he was not able to find any in my defense it hadn't been easy with all my sleeping difficulties but however i looked at it i could only wait 
So, he says that he tried to be normal, but then he was not able to sleep during the nights. So, that was the only one troubling him, but still he liked to wait. The pilgrimage trail was well trodden, but I did not fancy doing it alone. So, the pilgrimage trail means the route to that uh, pilgrimage area or, the, or to that temple or where he wanted to complete his pilgrimage was quite clear and it was well trodden means people travelled a lot and it was very clear, but then he did not fancy doing it alone means he did not imagine that he would want to do it alone. The Kora was seasonal because parts of the route were liable to blockage by snow. So, this pilgrim was kind of seasonal because during certain times the road would be covered by snow. I had no idea whether or not the snow had cleared, but I was not encouraged by the chunks of dirty ice that still clung to the banks of Darkens, Darkens Brook. So, he is saying that I did not want to go to that alone because you might never know when there would be snow in front of you. So, he did not want to uh, go through those dirty pieces of snow that were there on the banks of the Darkens Brook. Darkens Brook means stream. So, the stream that was there in Darken also had dirty snow on some parts. So, he did not want to see such type and so that is why he did not want to go forward alone. Since Satan had left, I had not come across anyone in Darken with enough English to answer even the most basic questions. So, after Satan, his driver left, he did not find anybody who could speak with him in English. Even the basic questions that he asked, nobody was able to answer. Until that is, I met Norbu. So, until he met Norbu. So, who is Norbu? We will come to know. So, the cafe was small, dark and cavernous with a long metal stove that ran down the middle. The walls and the ceiling were wreathed in sheets of multiple colored plastic and striped variety broad blue, red and white that is made into stout voluminous shopping bags sold all over China and in many countries of Asia as well as Europe. So, he was talking about the cafe, how it was, how it was designed using, you know, rugs and sheets of paper and plastic and all colored papers and he was also telling about the kind of huge shopping bags that were available in these parts. In these parts and also in parts of Asia as well as Europe. As such, plastic must rate as one of China's most successful exports along the Silk Road today. So, this plastic is one of the most important products of export by China in this route, the Silk Road today. What is the Silk Road? Silk Road is the uh, uh, trial used by traders for exporting their goods. So, this is the road taken by our narrator as well to reach Mount Kailash. So, the cafe had a single window beside which I had taken a position so that I could see the pages of my notebook. So, he was sitting in the cafe alone and he was sitting with a notebook looking at the window as well. I had bought a novel with me to help pass the time. So, he also had a book so that he could read and pass the time. Norbu saw my book when he came in and asked with a gesture if he could sit opposite me at my rickety table. So, Norbu came inside and he asked him if he could sit next to him. And you English, he inquired after he had ordered tea. So, Norbu came and sat just opposite to him and he asked him if he was English, he was an English man. So, what is a rickety table? A table that was about to collapse or fall, a poorly made table or an old table. So, I told him I was and we struck up a conversation. So, he said yes, he was an Englishman and they started to talk. I did not think he was from those parts because he was wearing a wind cheater and a metal rimmed spectacles of a western style. So, he by looking at his clothes and the uh, glasses that he wore, he could understand that he was from the western side and not belonging to that particular locality. He was a Tibetan, he told me, but working in Beijing at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in the Institute of Ethnic Literature. So, he was not staying, though he was a Tibetan, Norbu was working in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I assumed he was on some sort of field work. Yes and no, he said, I have come to do the Kora. My heart jumped. So, he said, yes, he had come here to do some work 
as well he had come here to do the kora so his heart jumped he was excited because now that he has got a companion because his uh, wish also was to do the kora and now he has found one more person who is going to do the kora norbu had been writing academic papers about the kailash kora and its importance in various works of buddhist literature for many years he told me but he had never actually done it himself so norbu was a person who was writing about the importance of kailash kora especially in buddhist literature and he said that he never had done it himself so when the time came for me to tell him what brought me to darkin his eyes lit up so after some time he the narrator told him why he was here at darkin so when he told norbu that he also wanted to do the kora that man also felt very happy we could be a team he said excitedly so norbu told him yes see both of us have the same wish so that we could form a team and go the two two academics who have escaped from the library perhaps my positive thinking strategy was working after all so the narrator was having a trying to have a, a lot of positive thoughts and he says that that was able to work and bringing some good uh, things because he was able to meet this norbu who was also going to do the kora and so two academics both of them are from the literature world so they were feeling so happy for meeting each other so that they can go together for the kora my initial relief at meeting norbu who was also staying in the guest house was tempered by the realization that he was almost as ill equipped as i was for the pilgrimage so first he was happy to meet norbu but then this happiness decreased because he understood that norbu was not properly equipped for going to the pilgrimage that means they had to take a lot of precautionary measures but both of them were not uh, equipped properly for completing the pilgrimage he kept telling me how fat he was and how hard it was going to be so norbu was quite fat and he was going on worried about that because it was not easy for them to complete the kora very high up he kept reminding me so tiresome to walk and so he kept telling that it was difficult for him to walk especially upward because he was quite fat he wasn't really a practicing buddhist it was transpired but he had enthusiasm and he was of course tibetan so he was not a very strong buddhist he did not practice buddhism but then he was very enthusiastic and he was a tibetan so this is what the narrator understood about norbu although i had originally envisaged making the trek in the company of devout believers on reflection i decided that perhaps norbu would turn out to be the ideal companion so he had thought that he would be able to complete the kora in the company of an ideal believer but then he understood that norbu was not a buddhist he was not an ideal buddhist he was only enthusiastic about it and he wanted to write some papers about it so that's why he was uh, doing the kora but still he understood that he was the ideal person with whom he would be able to complete the kora he suggested we hire some yaks to carry our luggage which i was interpreted as a good sign and he had no intention of prostrating himself all around the mountain so norbu suggested that they will take yaks those animals found in those areas to carry the luggage and he felt the narrator felt happy on listening to this suggestion and he also had no idea that is norbu did not want to prostrate around the mountains prostrate means lie with stretched body on the ground so he said that he will not be doing that not possible he cried collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter so he was saying that it is impossible for him to lie down or stretch uh, uh, all along the body by him in front of the mountain because he knew that he was very fat it wasn't his style and in way his tummy was too big so he was not a very strong buddhist and at the same time he was very fat so this is what the narrator understood about norbu so he was very happy and he was describing how they would go to the uh, mountain or do the kora with the help of yaks to carry their luggage and so the narrator felt excited 
at having found a companion who was also an amusing person so that both of them can complete the Quora together. I hope you like the video. For more informative videos, do subscribe to Hello English Teacher. Like, share and give your valuable comments below. Thank you for watching.